Hi, Paul. How are you? Good, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming again. Uh, yes, last time around we had a very uh, in-depth discussion about uh, uh, fundamentals of tennis, right? Uh, wherein you spoke about the importance of the use of the ground you know, to maximum advantage that a player can uh, have, uh, can actually you know, maximize his uh, tennis play by using ground. Uh, so today uh, we're going to uh, discuss about the mental conditioning uh, because as we understand in today's competitive tennis, uh, competitive age of sport uh, as a whole, mental conditioning, the mental makeup of players has become all the more important, right? And uh, like we also discussed just a little bit last time around, I mean, a lot of matches are won or lost, uh, you know, in a, in a mind itself, right? No matter how good, good mm -hmm. skill, skill set our player is, uh, but if the mental makeup or the uh, mental conditioning is not good enough, he uh, wins uh, those same matches. I mean, he loses those same matches he should have won, right? Mm, uh, definitely. Yes. 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 Uh, so obviously, uh, Paul, you have seen a lot of players across different ages, different uh, era. You know, uh, different time. Uh, 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 you know, right from the days when, uh, of course, in the nineteen nineties, so when you were with uh, Bat, uh, Britannia, uh, ten, uh, Amrit Raj tennis, uh, mm -hmm. wherein uh, you know you saw Indian players. Of course, uh, a little bit down down the time, you also you know saw players uh, like your own Thai superstar, whom you also had coached for uh, some time. Uh, Paradon switch upon. So, how much has that evolved to now? You know, in terms of mental conditioning. I mean, uh, when I'm talking evolution, I'm not only talking about players getting more mentally tough. Maybe I don't know. Uh, also, uh, mental conditioning as a sports science. You know, the overall you know mm. ecosystem, so to say. Yeah. Yes. Has it moved at all? Yeah. <laughs> has it oh. changed at all? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. Um, you you summed it up really well on your introduction. You said how important it was and that it can change matches and it can do all these things. You can lose because of poor mental conditioning in matches. You can win matches because you've got superior mental abilities. But over the years, we've never really, uh, tennis has never really embraced mental training nor yeah, oh. introduced it in, into our daily training. As a, like, I think years ago and many players and coaches may not remember this, but even physical conditioning was not part of a normal session. True. And now it's just part, every session, yeah, every training academy has mental, uh, sorry, physical fitness as, as one of the key elements of a player's development. But mental training has never moved ahead at all. And we tend to, we tend to also, when it does, when, when there are places that teach players how to think and you know, be stronger mentally and all those things. It's normally done off the court and in a, by a different person. It's not really ever been integrated into training on a daily basis. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Um, so, I mean, uh, for you, for example, when do you think is the right time uh, for a kid to uh, undergo mental training? Is there, of course, it's a very subjective question, question maybe uh, to start off with. But uh, I know there is no, I mean, I don't think I can set an age uh, to that. But mm. is it f still, I'm asking, is it five years, six years, seven years? At some point in time, it'll start it, right? So how young can you actually inculcate those mental training into a, uh, into a kid, so, so to say? As soon as they start hitting the ball, the very first day. Oh, I mean, really? It's, it's, okay. it, it, really, it really is like, you know, if you take, if you take an absolute beginner, and let's imagine a six-year-old. Um, you're obviously, yeah, you're going to integrate technical things, forehand, backhand, and things like that. They're going to get a chance to swing at the ball. At the same time today, within the training of a six-year-old, there's, there's a bit of movement that goes on. You just want them to get familiar with moving to a ball, spacing, you know, all, these, all these types of things. At the same time, we should be teaching them the skills to uh, that they can use the mental skills that they can use as well. It should be, and, and this is where I'm coming from right in the beginning when I started was to say the mental training should be integrated right from the beginning. We're doing, you know, at the moment there is um, a tremendous problem around the competitive tennis world uh, at, the, at the lower levels, not, not, not at the top. WTA and ATP they have their minds sorted out already. They, they know, that's how they got there. 
that's how they rose above the rest. Yeah. All the all all the rest need trained uh, for it, um, and it's just not being done. So there is an epidemic of mental meltdowns occurring throughout the junior circuit and and futures circuit you know, all over the world because of this problem. We don't introduce mental training early enough in a player's career and their development. Okay, okay, I got it. But uh, just want to understand now, for example, a six-year-old kid, you know, um, he comes to academy just to have fun, you know, because fun in the sense, uh, fun I think is the first element for him or her to really pick up a tennis racket, right? They would, I mean, yes. just run around. Uh, and without, of course, I'm not trying to say that, you know, you can't put some uh, form of matter to, to that fun element as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, now to the same six-year-old kid, how do you actually manage to, you know, inculcate those mental behaviors, saying, look, okay, this is how it should be. Because for him or her, he is really not thinking too much beyond, okay, you know, okay, I need the professional tennis player. I don't think they really think too early, you know, of course. The first thing for them is, okay, I need to, I love playing tennis. Okay, I, this is the way I'm going to hit the ball. And uh, this is the way my body is going to move. I'm going to feel happy about it. I think that's, that's it. And beyond that, uh, I don't, I, I don't think that they will really think beyond that, right? So, how do you manage to uh, inculcate those mental behavior in the same six-year-old kid in, in a subtle way, so to say? Well, it is. It's done in a subtle way. <laughs> you, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, if you've got a very young child, they're there because they want to have fun, and if they don't have fun, they won't come back to tennis. So, but but here's the thing. Um, if you challenge young children, and I don't mean uh, way above their ability, I'm meaning proportionate to their, their age and their physical ability and all that. But if you challenge them, that is a form of mental training. Okay. That, that's, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm getting at. So, okay. you know, maybe, maybe uh, coaches that are listening or uh, parents, they may have this, this um, idea that mental training is sort of a, you know, uh, uh, a very tough, stringent sort of regime. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. It, sure. It's really, it's really not. I mean, what, yeah. what you? I mean, I, I would say, what is the first? Um, I've never really thought about it in this way, but with that question, I'm thinking, what would be the first step? Make it fun. Now, challenge sure. them, and challenge them on the court. Make it fun. Now, if you go to the majority of courts around the world with, say, very young children on the court. What you might see is the uh, is the child standing stationary with a ball being dropped for them to make mm. it easy, so called make yeah, it yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. And and you know, and that goes on and on and on. Um, you know, I would take the beginner at any level, like whether they're sort of talented or semi talented or not talented at all, and I would challenge them with a ball that they had to move to. And as soon, you know, you, you're just going in small, small steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say initially you're trying to make it fun and and yet challenge them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yes. So, like you said, it has to be made in a very subtle way, you know, and wherein the, you know, he doesn't feel too much about the whole thing, but it becomes a process in the long run. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and very often, yeah, around courts that I see all the elements are there. There's different, you know, there may be five or six different types of drill they do, but they do them in isolation. So it's very static and not a lot of fun at all. So you have, you know, 10 children lining up waiting for a hit for one ball and they okay. come in and they miss, and they miss the ball and they go all the way back to the back of the queue again. <laughs> yeah. There are ways to get yeah. everybody out there. Involved, yeah. Multiple, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, one of the one of the suggestions I often give to coaches who are coaching beginners is I say within your hour because most young children only really um, have the stamina or focus to go for one hour, but I say to them in the hour make it your one goal is to give every kid a hundred balls. Okay. Now can mm -hmm. you um, can you imagine how that court changes? If every kid has to get a hundred balls, hit hit a hundred balls during that session, because at the moment they're probably hitting less than twenty in an hour session true, with true, a yeah. large group. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that's not fun and it's not challenging. So, you know, we, we're talking about mental, developing mental skills, give the kid lots of balls, and it's going to involve drills that are, you know, where they'll have to run and, and, and hit a ball in space and coordinate the ground timing for the ball, for the energy, and you know, things are going to be learnt almost. And what I do say to coaches uh, as, a, as a second point is stop coaching. Because yeah. the ball can actually coach the child by itself. Okay. If, if I give a six-year-old 100 balls a lesson every time they turn up, the drills and the ball, by nature of the, of the, you know, the frantic energy out there, um, is going to teach the player many of the things I would have had to stop and explain and waste time with. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that, that would be a very, you know, a couple of very basic things to get mental training started with beginners. Okay. The issue, mm -hmm. the issue, you know, a lot of beginners will be challenged when they come to a court anyway. But the issue actually comes in that if we don't start challenging players mentally um, after, you know, say, say, just after that beginning period, when does it get done? And I would suggest that it never gets done, that it's okay. left to the player to find how to cure a problem. So, you know, a, a normal development process is um, you go from beginner to sort of uh, beginner development level and you begin to go to the court every day and do your drills and do your thing. And, and then eventually you get to tournaments and that's when the pressure comes. But that mm -hmm. is also when, when the most fun occurs. That's why we, uh, it's it's tournament play that really keeps players in tennis. So now they come to tournament play, and we have this period of, you know, complete meltdowns on the court, lack of confidence, uh, buckling under stress, um, un unable to make decisions, unable to create points, unable to finish points. You know, just this multiple of Ooh. choking mm -hmm. goes on. So when is that addressed? Is it addressed? Because once you get to the tournaments and you're playing almost weekly and it's an ongoing process now for years, it's sort of tough to come in there now and say, you know, let's, uh, let's try these things mentally. It's okay. probably too mm -hmm. late. Okay. Okay. True. Got it. Yeah. So um, basically the coaches also have to be innovative, right? I mean, um, new ways of finding, you know, making it more, yeah. In, in engaging yes. for the kids. Now, one, one thing yes, that, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, true. Sorry. Uh, you want to add something to that? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, uh -huh. I'm agreeing totally. Yes. It takes, <laughs> okay. it takes, yeah. it, it takes, um, you know, coaches will have, to, I mean, that's why I sort of came up with the 100 ball thing. Because, you know, if, if that is the goal and they really try to get the 100 balls per player per session, um, all sorts of wonderful things happen on the court. There's True. no more wasted time or stopping yeah. to talk to one player while the other 10 players stand and wait. You know, you, again, you, you look at the average court today, um, that instruction um, can take up, you know, with each player being instructed and, and if they miss, then it's an instruction. And if they hit it, it could be another instruction. Yeah. Yeah. But it just, <laughs> the, the lesson just keeps stopping. Stop, yeah. And when it when it stops, everyone else in the queue has to stop also. Mm -hmm. And if you take away, basically, you know, you stop instructing verbally yourself, the ball can do it for you. So, you know, the creativity of coaches needs to be in how do I make the ball talk for me? Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you're if you're teaching if you're teaching ground, be deep and short balls to a beginner. And okay. teach them how to how to back off and mm -hmm. how to come forward. True, true, true. Yeah. And then the instruction can take place during the water break as they're taking a drink. Just quickly say, you know, I, I would recommend we start doing this. This is where this will get better. But then true, bang, true. Yeah. back yeah. back on the court yeah. and more balls. Right, right. So so in a way you're saying you should not uh, uh, interfere too much with the kids uh, thing, right? I mean, once they're playing, you should let them play because uh, they adapt themselves to that, right? To that whole situation as to how to hit the ball. But yes, uh, you know, it should be a continuous process. Let them enjoy it. 
but of course you need to come into the picture during break uh, you know and then give them the feedback the right feedback uh, but you sh should not interfere too much into their uh, scheme of things so to say right the kids yeah. yes yes i think you know if we can both remember back to when we were children um what we wanted to do if we turned up to tennis practice or football practice or cricket practice was hit the ball or kick the ball <laughs> True, yeah. and and if 75 percent of the time is taking up on theory and a discussion listening to a coach we're probably not going to be attracted to that too much yeah yeah so the, yeah. so the cr creativity has to occur you know in in getting that ball uh getting your drill to teach you know for instance if you if you if you uh, in in uh over the years players who have been brought up on a fast court have shorter backswings players yeah. who have been have been uh brought up on a on a slower surface have fuller swings players who get brought up on play uh have more extreme grips players who are brought up on faster surfaces have uh more let's say eastern grips more you know not not as fuller grips yeah, all yeah. these things were taught by the ball actually and the and the surface true, true and so yeah. hmm. you know a lot can be taught um and and you know it's not meaning that the coach has to dumb down in fact the coach has to smarten up because it's it's what sort of drill you're designing now and when do you come in and make your point and how can you you know abbreviate it to to its bare minimum so they understand but bang they can go back out and start again so it actually is a, a slightly different you know coaching skill that has to be realized um true yeah yeah true yeah now uh now you are you are a tennis coach right i mean you uh, obviously you know uh, uh teach more of the tennis tennis stuff to a player uh, but at the same time, you also, you know, inculcate the mental behavior into a player, right? So that that, that is from a tennis uh, uh, coach approach. Now we also have at the same time now so many sports psychologists, right? So what, how different will your approach be in terms in comparison to a sports psychologist? You know, I hope you're getting well, the point. Yes, uh, I, I'm, and I'm not sure um, because I I don't know quite how sports psychologists would deal with um let's say choking so i'd imagine it's done in a in a in a room or an office somewhere <laughs> okay okay and i guess yeah with me it's done on the court and and i just to just to go backwards a little bit um you know my many years ago i through various reasons i i decided I'd heard all this talk about 90 percent tennis is 90 percent mental and everybody said it and Nobody did it. So I, and I, I began to see how, uh, how many players were hindered by mental meltdowns of a whole variety. You know, humans are very complex and we, we melt down in different ways, anger, frustration, you know, all this shut down. We do it all in different ways, but it's all coming from the head. And I, you know, if you coach long enough, competitive players you begin to realize if you're not dealing with the mental side you're, you're really not able to help or shouldn't be in competitive player coaching True. so i began to sort of try to change my lesson from you know being probably i'd say just just for numbers sake 90 percent technical and i tried to change it to 90 percent mental and it took a lot of time but I can honestly say, and, and this is in comparison with, say, a sports psychologist who might be sitting in an office and doing it their way, yeah. that when I enter a court, um, the, first, the first area I attack is the head. I don't care. I mean, I'll have, um, I'll have a weak forehand. I'll have a you know, uh, poor net play or an errant serve. But I go to the head first because... The, one of the things that runs around in my head often is everything starts from the head and I don't care Ooh. what it is on the court. Yeah. You know, if, if I, if I approach net to you and I go into your backhand with a nice deep approach 
and you spray it out wide on the passing shot, you can't get it in. Um, I'm blaming your head for that. I'm not blaming okay. your backhand. True. Why would we go, Why would we go to a separate court and work on your backhand 500 oh. balls and come back and expect anything to be different? You you okay. you cracked mentally, mm. and then the backhand failed because the head uh, told it to fail or or couldn't support the shot. What okay. you were trying to do. True. So when I enter a court now. I'm looking 100% at the head first. And that involves all sorts of other things that come into it. You know, the personality of the player. That, that dictates quite a lot about how I'm going to approach the subject. Um, it could be you know, no, no trust built up yet. We might not know each other. So I'll have to go in a different way. There could be total trust in which I'd go into a different, I'd enter in a different way. Um, but you know, it, the mental side is happening right from the start. And then during the lesson, if it's an errant backhand, let's say on approach shots, um, I might very quickly give the player some technical stuff or maybe mental imagery or whatever on the passing shot down the line or wherever. And we will probably do it with a feed for a very short time. And then we go into some sort of drill that gives him or her multiple opportunities to hit passing shots down the line with real pressure. And often it involves points. So mm. if you were, you were to watch my lessons from outside the court, very often you, you'll be probably thinking, this guy's not coaching, he's just playing points all lesson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a lot of cases, I am. But... To me, the real coaching begins when those points begin. I mean, there's a saying in coaching, you know, you can teach a monkey to hit a backhand. Well, you know, so we do it and we quickly move on. Mental, uh, the mental part of that backhand has to be addressed now. But what happens in most situations is that the backhand is a problem. Um, the player is... Uh, taught the backhand and it's kept in what I call cotton wool. It's not, it's not put under stress or duress. And then the player goes to the tournament and true, true. It, yeah. it's, it's not working. Well, why? Because it was never tested and hardened. And, you know, this sort of brings up um, another point is this, um, this case of, the 500 ball or 1,000 ball repetitive type practice. And to me, you know, when, when coaches do that, there is a place for it, but it should not go to 500, 600 or 300 balls because, and I, I know as a player, and you may know also that if you hit 500 backhands down the line, it starts to feel really, really good. Yeah. And then, and, and you begin to get that thing everybody calls confidence. And with that confidence, you're feeling pretty good. And cool. then you get to the to tournament. And then in the tournament, you're still feeling good. You've had a lot of confidence building over the last two weeks. And then something goes wrong. You mistime that, that first yeah. backhand down the line. And the confidence seeps out of the bucket so fast, it's gone. Now, where did it go? Yeah, yeah. Now, so let's go back to training. The 500 ball drill mm -hmm. gave you muscle memory, and that was all. And so it's got a, a small part to play in tennis training, but it's the, it's the one go-to thing for almost every training facility. And we also have this epidemic of mental meltdowns in tournaments. So can you see the correlation? Yeah. Yeah, we're, not, we're not securing the brain of the player that we're teaching and then sending them out into the big wide world into tournaments and they're not performing. And everybody said, oh, you know, uh, mentally not strong. Well, how on <laughs> earth can they be mentally True. strong? Yes. So, you know, we go all the way back to say, when does this start? What age is it? it starts from day one. 
and it starts in increments. And by the yeah. time they are good players, um, they, they will be performing both technically, hopefully tactically, and then mentally as well. True, yeah. Yeah, so um, now in your training, I guess there will also be a real mock-like situation, right? For example, uh, what is a pressure situation? In, in a typical match, pressure comes when a server is down, say 30, 40 on his one serve, basically a break point, right? So will you also yeah. have kind of that kind of a mock, mock uh, situation wherein you tell, you tell your player, okay, now you're down, you know, just a made up uh, story that you are down uh, 30, 40 on your serve and this is what it is. So that, you know, it kind of conditioned him, him you know, okay, this is the situation I already faced, even though in a practice session and now, yes. you know, in, yes. in a real match situation, this is what it is. So I, I guess yeah. that's look, something that you... Yeah, that, look, there's, there's many ways to do it now. Now, now that we've sort of progressed yeah, yeah, to how yeah. to do it. Yes, can yeah. you just um, the, give a few? Yeah, minutes? okay. Look, there is a, there is a theory that I uh, developed many years ago called the 3 a.m. theory. And basically what that is, is to take away all the cotton wool that most uh, training supplies the player. They keep them, They keep them safe. They don't expose them to the danger of not hitting it right or, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they keep them in cotton wool. And I, I immediately take them out of that. 3 a.m. basically is that, you know, in the, in the case of the serve, for instance, um, and I think we mentioned this on a, on a previous talk, but I would have, I would have, it, let's say it's the uh, yeah, second serve, which is normally, most players are pretty decent with their first, but their second is the one that will choke. Yeah. So, you know, I might have a player sit off on the court and I call this the nominated player game and they will sit in a chair on court side. Um, two players will play points and at different times, I will bring that player from the chair into the court and oh. make them serve under pressure. And, oh. and yeah, I mean, in the beginning, it doesn't work. And, um, but very, very quickly within, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you're starting to see them operate because you know, what have I done? I've done the opposite of the cotton wool. You know, the cotton wool effect would be to take that player and do basket after basket of serving with more spin, which is the case in a second serve, so that hopefully when they get to the tournament, it's going to be fine because the technique is being fixed. Yeah. But we know that doesn't happen. We know it's, again, everything starts in the head. So the double faulting in the tournaments is the head. So the head has to be addressed. So basket after basket, day after day for weeks, you know, it seems like it should work, but it just doesn't. What we have to, and, that, and that's the cotton wool effect. And coaches may even say, look, give me another month or two on the second serve and then, you know, Joey or Sally can go to tournaments. But, you know, that's yeah. the cotton wool effect. True. And I do the exact opposite. I will teach, um, maybe it's technical. Maybe we do need a bit more you know, lift in the ball, top spin, feel for the arc of the ball, that type of thing. I'll teach that and I'll teach it as quick as I can. And then I'll put them under stress with it. So, you know, you can see now how mental training can be basically inputted into every session you do. And, and a lot of it is just basically take out repetition. Too much of it. Take it out. Take out long-winded talks. Just have them under pressure, doing things under pressure. True. And, you know, get them to tournaments as quick as possible. Often, you know, parents will contact me and say they would like their daughter or son to come for training. And, oh, they have this problem. And invariably, it's mental. You know, they're just not, they haven't won for six months. They haven't done this. It's invariably mental. And so, you know, I will often in that conversation say, well, look, you know, come for this 10-day period, but is there a tournament they can play straight after it? Yeah, and okay. there's almost mm -hmm. like, a, uh, like a hush goes over the conversation on the phone. Like, oh my gosh, I don't think that's enough time. That is often, yeah, I don't think that's yeah. enough time, is it? Okay. But you see, again, what I want to do is to um, 
train the problem and have them go straight into deep water in the form of a tournament where there's pressure. Because I, I want to see, you know, have we been effective? True, true. Yeah, true. Uh, okay, uh, I just picked up something uh, maybe relevant. Uh, when you were saying about a second serve, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of course, second serve, every, everything goes for a conservative second serve so that there is no double fall, right? Um, and they, you know, basically plays uh, defensively on the second serve. But we have also seen players like Mark Filipposis who would go bang, bang, even on the second serve. So his mentality is totally different, right? Obviously, I'm sure when he goes for a second serve, he thinks, I'm not going to make a mistake. He's going to win ace or whatever. So uh, is it not going to be a conflict, <laughs> you know, if you tell, for example, the same Mark Filipposis, okay, you're actually going to, uh, you know, go for a high, high spinning, you know, a high bouncing spinning ball instead of a, a flat serve, you know, going for an ace. So how do you tackle such a guy with that kind of mindset? Because I'm sure he has a positive mindset of going there and hitting an ace. And he's not actually thinking of a double fall at all, right? I, I, I hope that, you know, it's making sense. Yeah, you know, I, I understand. Um, but there is a bit of misunderstanding between us. Because when you started asking that question, I smiled because I never ask players to slow it down and be conservative on a second serve. Uh oh, okay. I don't okay. do that. Yeah, yeah. no, I, yeah. I want them to hit the biggest second serve yeah. of okay. their lives every oh, time. Okay. Well, okay. um, but, but to do that, you need um, control through spin. Um, every ball must, must contain spin. Uh, there's no such thing as a flat ball. Every ball must contain spin. Now, if you're going to really hit the ball hard, and, and I think if we were to go back and, well, I think even modern day players, uh, Philip Poussis probably had you know, two big serves, but uh, even the modern day players have fairly big second serves. There's not yeah. much taken mm -hmm. off them. Mm -hmm. um, but what you'll see is probably a little more lift through the ball as they hit it as hard as they can. So, yeah. you know, you're probably on a first serve, you're trying to make the ball go from A to B as quickly as possible. And you want the same thing to happen on a, on a, uh, on a second serve and particularly in doubles, you know, because, you know, in doubles now today, you know, serves are big. There's no more of this uh, kick serve bouncing up around a player's shoulders saying uh, you'll be creamed at the top level. So, you know, you, you may, I think, again, um, you, you went to the conservative view of what I said. Whereas, oh. yeah, no, I'm meaning, no, the biggest second serve uh, in, in the world, you know, to hit the thing <laughs> yeah. as hard as you can. But, you know, when, when we had that analogy, it could have been because players had a fear of doing it. And often on a second serve, it's not because we hit too hard or too risky, because we choke and tighten. And the arc goes out of the ball and the, the upward drive, you know, we retract we, we rather than expand into the second serve. Mm. Okay, got it. So, I mean, uh, among the current crop of player, uh, who do you think has the best mental, uh, you know, makeup? Okay, not necessarily that he has to be a Novak or a Rafa, you know. It could be a maybe a out of 50, you know, ranked player also, who might not, you know, who would have made up for his lack of uh, maybe a little uh, tennis skill, but with such mental pain to make up that he has, he would have compensated a lot uh, for, for the lack of, of his tennis skill on the other side, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would, I, I, just offhand, I can't think of anyone that stands out, but I think that's probably the reason why that is so is because so many of the top players are so good mentally. We can, we can point to Nadal and his you know, tremendous fight and feistiness and uh, never say die attitude. But, you know, we think of Nadal often because you know, of his, of his incredible run at Roland Garros and stuff, and you'd have to be amazingly strong mentally yeah. to do that. Um, but then again, you know, all the others have it also. We just have different personalities and we show it differently. Um, you know, Djokovic, I would say, would be way up there in mental yeah. toughness. I mean, just, uh, I mean, just even, I mean, you took, take the top 10, the, the mental stress of staying in the top 10 is, you know, is, it's a real, it's, it's a strain. 
to front up every day, year after year. I mean, you've got to put the training in, the, uh, the application and your private life is sort of going on hold for many years. It just the, the single mindedness of being in the top 10 is grueling. And I think that's what holds, you know, the players on the fringes, people like Monfi and all these guys. Yeah. With, with the same talent. They just can't put the same amount of single mindedness. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's almost, uh, yeah, I mean, you look at the Jokovic's and stuff and the diets and the fitness regimes and all that. Um, this is why they're there. And, and, you know, the ability to stay there is a form of mental toughness, mental you know, skill. Um, because the mo most of us will, will melt, would melt <laughs> at, uh, at the stress they're under. True, true, true. Now, talking about personalities, uh, since you mentioned uh, about that, obviously you've got different personalities uh, in tennis or really any sport, right? For, for example, actually I asked the same question to somebody else also, but I think it really makes sense. Now, for example, uh, earlier you used to see players like uh, John McEnroe and you know, uh, Gordon Ivan Ivanisovic mm -hmm. who would really throw tantrums, you know, breaking rackets and all that. Yeah, uh, that's one man, uh, personal uh, trait that I have, uh, but not meaning that, you know, uh, they will again come back with a, a very bad game, right? So how do you manage such, such players? I'm talking about the mental conditioning because if you maybe, maybe they have vented out something, you know, uh, and then uh, maybe help. Again, I'm not talking about the ethical part of it. Uh, of course, it's mm. not good. <laughs> You're not going, you should not do that on tennis court at all. But I'm talk, talking more from the mental makeup. I'm talking from the different personalities that we all have. Uh, so how do you manage it, you know? So you're, you're basically saying, if I had McEnroe, how would I deal with him? Yes. That, that's, or yeah, players, yeah, yeah. players like that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, that's what, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, you obviously have to let somebody be himself. Right? When I'm saying be himself, it doesn't mean that yes. you know, yeah. if you ask McEnroe to be himself, then he'll do a lot of, lot of other things as well. But I'm yeah. saying, you know, in a controlled manner, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look. In tennis, we tend to have a lot of sort of, uh, I guess we call them type A people. They are very driven and very uh, single-minded and, and they, those type of people tend to be very hard on themselves. Um, and then, you know, then I guess you, know, you have your, your very own Yuki Banbury, who is a very calm guy on court and he always has been. Yeah. And there, there's actually an example of someone who came along, I guess the genetics were good. And uh, I don't think he's had to work that much on, you know, on the mental side. He was always a very calm, calculated sort of player when all the other people around him weren't. True. And he went along, he's gone a long way and let's hope he continues. Um, but if, if you're dealing with all these different personality types, you, you did right. You have to allow them to, you know, you, you can't change a John McEnroe um, just as you can't ask, a, you know, from the old days, if we're talking about you know, a Bjorn Borg to, to start, you know, expressing himself. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and, you know, the great thing about tennis is it allows, and sport in general, it allows all personalities. So as a coach, you're probably having to deal with um, what you've got. I, I, you know, there is, there is uh, you know, I, I have had very volatile players uh, in the past and very often uh, you have to sort of understand the person also themselves a little bit um, and why they do it. You know, there's all sorts of, again, you know, to repeat, humans are very complicated. And, you know, you, you may, I mean, I, I give the analogy if, uh, you know, you drop a, a glass of water, yeah. you know, it could instigate laughter. You know, you could do, oh, oh yeah, I've dropped the yeah. water. True. Or embarrassment mm. or anger yeah. or frustration. But it's the same act of dropping the water. Yeah. So it really is um, a case where the coach has to understand the personality of the player. And if that drop water creates anger, then I guess that's what you've got and you have to deal with it okay. you know, as, as a coach to the player. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And, you know, and I've had players who have really hurt their careers because they haven't been able to keep it together. Mm. Um, but I've had, I've had a case just recently, actually, of a, of a younger guy who was sort of a serial, um, uh, how would you say, uh, clown on the court um, <laughs> and, and acted up a lot. He, he has come around really quick because it seems now, looking back, that all he needed was guidance on, on how, to, how to do it. And he was so talented that once given the right direction, he basically calmed down and said, I'm here to play. Whereas what I was seeing when I, in the early days uh, was just total frustration at not being able to, he knew he had talent in him. Probably not many people outside knew it. And I didn't exactly know it when I watched him play, but boy, the, the, the uh, tirades that would go on. And you'd think, well, maybe this, this boy is a waste of time. He can't control himself. But on, on sort of being directed on, on you know, multiple things, he sort of said, okay, I get it. I have a job to do. And now in matches, he's busy getting on with his job. So there's a whole lot of myriad of, you know, situations with players that, that differ. Um, you know, David Sharan, for example, is an extremely, you know, quiet guy on court. Yeah. But there's a huge fire inside him. Mm. Huge fire, competitive yeah. fire. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he is a very competitive guy, but, you know, you just don't see it from the outside. Whereas, yeah. you know, someone like Leander Pays, you see everything. Yeah. You see it all. True. And yet, you know, off court, he's fairly calm, sort of character. Very yes, yes. calm. Actually, yeah, true. But, yeah. but the, when the fire does stoke up, you see everything. Yes, it's true. So, you know, as a coach, I guess, if there are coaches listening to this, you know, it's important that we look at players not as, as sort of all being common and a bad temper is a bad temper and a, you know, all the, because we're all a bit different and we all do things for different reasons. We react for different reasons. Yeah. True, true. Uh, so uh, yeah, how, how important will meditation play in mental conditioning? I mean, do you, do you inculcate uh, that uh, habit also? I mean, how, how does it work? Yeah, I, I do it a lot. Um, yes. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because I had a group just recently. Um, we did it over over um, a Zoom meeting oh, of about 24 ch children. Oh, and okay. I sort of got a, a, a bit of a, a funny response from one of the coaches afterwards um, saying, you know, like it's uh, yeah, almost like yoga meditation was like voodoo. And, um, <laughs> I, said, and I, I said, well, you know, mm -hmm. I can stop doing it if you like. Um, but he was okay. But I said, look, no, it doesn't. It's not uh, anti-religion or, you know, I sort of had to mm -hmm. qualm his fears a wee bit. But no, um, I, I find uh, meditation really helpful. And uh, in uh, I've used it sometimes on really, and I'll say bad cases. I don't mean it in a bad, bad, but cases where players are having just so many difficulties that might relate to off court as well and just in in that sort of zone yeah. and yeah there are different obviously different meditations for different purposes and needs but no I, I use it quite a lot and and I encourage I encourage tennis players to take up you know, forms of meditation um, I remember uh, quite a few years ago I had an Indian male player who uh, his mind was actually too quick. So <laughs> and often, you know, which is great. I mean, tennis, you have to have a very fast brain. It has to go from skill complexity to skill complexity very fast. And he was just doing it sometimes a little bit too fast. And there were a few errors here and there based on that. And we sort of knew what was going on. And we had to bring him back. Like it was almost recalibrating him. And there is, uh, we used yoga for that. And I think it was the, I forget the yoga term, uh, the Sanskrit term, but it's uh, staring at the flame. 
of uh-huh. the candle. Mm-hmm. And that that calibrated his mind. And we had no problems after that. So, you know, there are a lot of interesting, um, yeah, interesting anecdotes I have with yoga. It's very valuable. And in, in India, you should be doing it. I mean, all the academies should be doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, we, not just the stretching. True, true, true. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Uh, again, it's been such an interesting discussion. And uh, I'm sure all our coaches and players will really, you know, uh, have great help from this, whoever is uh, listening to this. And uh, we uh, discussed so many things to start off with, with. You said that there could not be any, you know, age to start off when it comes to, uh, you know, mental training, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, kid as young as six years, if he's fed with uh, different types of balls on a tennis court, then why not the mental training as well, right? Because it's just mm-hmm. another process, mm-hmm. yes. And you also uh, spoke about uh, being inventive in the same uh, mental training for the coaches, right? I mean, uh, like feeding 100 balls, uh, let, letting them uh, enjoy the moment and then actually give the feedback instead of in- interfering with uh, those same kids, you know, in between. Yeah. And then also, also we uh, discussed about uh, the different uh, mock drills that you would be doing with your own players, right? Uh, uh, you will create a situation wherein somebody is uh, going through a certain uh, uh, situation of, say, uh, down a break point, right? Uh, which mm-hmm. you would uh, obviously be in a real mass situation. And then you actually, you know, let them overcome that in a practice situation so that it becomes kind of a process, a process right? It's all about a process. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Then we also spoke about different personality types um, on a tennis court, how to handle them. We've got different, uh, like you have yourself had so many different uh, players with different personality traits and how to handle them, yes. So it's really been, uh, uh, again, very enriching in terms of the knowledge, the expertise that you have been you know, offering uh, uh, for over so many years and now you're offering, still offering to us. So thank you so much, Paul. And it was really a pleasure catching up with you again for, this, for the second series. And uh, hopefully we'll again, uh, you know, have another series uh, you know coming soon yes look thank you very much also and you know this is probably my favorite topic i think it's uh, something that's lacking in tennis True. and there needs to be more of it so i've enjoyed the talk there's there's much more True. 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 thank you so much paul again thank you so much and uh, yeah thank you very much thank you Thanks. bye good night